This is Keys to the Shop, episode 336, Management and Leadership Masterclass with Selena Vigera of Blue Bottle Coffee. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I am your host for the show, and I'm really thankful to have you with us today. If you would, just hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this show, and that way you'll be updated automatically when we have new episodes like this one drop. And if you really want to help the show out and spread the word about Keys to the Shop, you can share these episodes. Share the show or the episodes with a friend, with your team, uh, with your boss, uh, somebody who you know can benefit from the content that the topics cover and that we have uh, our guests talk about here on the show. It would really mean a lot to me and gets this great information out to the community. So I wanted to make you aware of one of the aspects of Keys to the Shop Consulting that might be beneficial for you, and that is setting up consultation and coaching calls. This is where you and I get to uh, get on the phone around a particular uh, problem or opportunity or project and work through it on a regular and structured basis where you end up with the tools, clarity, and solutions that you need for the problem to either be resolved or the project to be successful. Whatever the subject, having these kinds of conversations has been remarkably beneficial for every client that I've had and really is at the heart of every kind of package of consulting that Keys to the Shop Consulting has undertaken over the years. So if that particular service sounds really interesting to you and you want to learn more about Keys to the Shop Consulting, just email me, chris at keys to the shop.com, C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com, and uh, we'll set up a free discovery call and talk about whether or not working with Keys to the Shop Consulting is right for you. Again, that email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, today's episode is brought to you by the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee. This is really something that I love for coffee because it is elevating batch brew coffee to an entirely new level through its SCA award-winning technology. The Ground Control Cyclops Brewer allows you to extract flavors from your coffee that previously were just not available because of the limitations of technology and to do so repeatedly. This gives an amazing experience to your customers and it's so gratifying for you as the user as well. Um, Not only is this an elevation of batch brew coffee, but the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer also creates tea, batched iced lattes, batched cold brew. So it adds a ton of versatility on top of an elevation in quality. Check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee and learn more about this amazing piece of equipment. If you're looking to level up your batch brew coffee and more, then I highly recommend looking into getting the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer for your cafe. Again, find out more information over at groundcontrol.coffee. This episode is also brought to you by the Barista Series from Pacific. This is the line of plant-based performance beverages that is relied upon by professionals all around the world because it is made for professionals. It is created with baristas in mind, and then those baristas give a lot of feedback before these beverages are put out there into the public. That's why they perform so well. They stand up to the heat from steaming. They produce amazing texture for latte art. They keep the balance of the beverage's taste focused on the coffee, so it's not a really overwhelming thing. It's just all right, and this is something your customers absolutely appreciate, and you can literally taste the intentionality in all of these beverages. So uh, go check them out over at pacificfoodservice.com. Get samples in your store and try it for yourself, and I think you really are going to be impressed. If you're looking to serve your customers the best plant-based beverages, then I think you should be serving the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, well, today we are going to get a masterclass in management and leadership uh, from somebody who's been in the business of coffee for over 20 years, 22 years, uh, basically starting her career right around the same time that I did. And her approach to how she's learned how to uh, lead herself and others on the bar is really inspiring. So I'm excited to talk to her today. We're talking with Selena Vigera of Blue Bottle Coffee. 
Like I mentioned, uh, Selena has been in the coffee industry for over 20 years and has a reputation for being not only an amazing barista, but an inspirational leader. Uh, she leads the Barista Guild Cafe at the Specialty Coffee Expo and U.S. Coffee Champs. Uh, she's been a lead barista at TED in Vancouver, as well as TEDx Women and TEDx Med. Her latte art is featured on the Pacific Series Oat and Rice Packages, which is a fun fact to know. And she has been the face of Blue Bottle in Los Angeles for years. Selena has managed some of the busiest Blue Bottle cafes in North America, such as San Francisco's Ferry Building location and her current store, Los Angeles's uh, Abbott Kinney location, where she's been the manager for over seven years. Now, what I think is really special about Selena, uh, which there are a lot of things I think you're going to find out in this conversation, is that her experiences in the industry are all based on long-term employment at a couple of places where she has grown exponentially. And if you listen to our last shift break about you know long-term employment in a coffee shop and the benefits there, you'll know why I feel that that's so special. Um, and in this conversation, we're going to be exploring how Selena got into the coffee industry and her journey into discovering her niche of leadership, management, and training in the cafe and the why behind her passion for serving her team with tireless devotion to creating happy employees and a great culture in every place that she's worked. So this truly is a masterclass in leadership and management as Selena breaks down her career, her mindsets, her methodologies, and gives advice to those of us who find ourselves in positions of leadership in the cafe. So excited to share this with you. Let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with Selena Figuera of Blue Bottle Coffee. Well, Selena, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you today? I am doing great. Woke up early, took a shower, and I'm ready. <laughs> oh man, you are poised and ready to go. Good. Um, well, I am definitely excited to talk about this. You have got uh, such a, a long career in coffee and very steady one, and you have had such a great impact on the people that you've led throughout your time in, in leadership in coffee. So I'm excited for what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you've been in the business of coffee officially uh, for, it is 22 years now, right? Like basically 22 years. You started back it in 2000? 22 years, yes. Oh, gosh. Does it feel like 22 years? Not at all. I can still remember the first days at my previous job and my first day at Blue Bottle like it was yesterday. It, it, it goes fast, especially when you found something that you obviously love to do. You wouldn't uh, be where you are today if that wasn't the case. And so uh, curious to start at the beginning a little bit here and figure out how you got into the coffee industry and some of the milestones along the way that really led you to pursue it as a career. So how did you begin back all the way in uh, 2000? You know, when I first moved back here after college in the Philippines in 2000 and really struggled to find work, um, you know, back home, the focus is really a lot on education. Like college is non-negotiable <laughs> with your parents, you know, and it isn't common that you you work and go to school like it is here. And then you come here and, you know, everything's about previous experience. So it was really, really hard for me to find my first job. And so I found a random gig telemarketing that paid really well, but was so stressful. But I met somebody there that then introduced me to this internet cafe in Hollywood. So it was like my second job fresh out of college um, from another country. And yeah, so it was Cyber Java Internet Cafe in Hollywood at the time, still standing as Tiago. Now it's on the corner of Hollywood and La Brea. And, you know, for the first eight years, like I mentioned, like there was just something about being behind a bar. I think the physicality I really enjoyed, um, just multitasking and calculating how to put drinks together, how to be the most efficient. And those were back then it was just like really instinctual for me. Like I wanted to please the people on the opposite side of the counter. This is also, I think, where I, I realized that I had a knack for connecting with people across the counter and like just those two things put together. I thrived being behind bar, even solo without help, 
and just like developing those relationships. And, you know, and I think we've all experienced that in coffee where you have those regulars, you have this following now that every time you're behind bar, they have this idea that every time you make the drinks, it's the best. And that just fed my like, I just loved what I did, you know, and I think the turning point into this actually being my thing. And so I would constantly get recruited because it was the bottom of a Hollywood entertainment building. So I was doing like full-time jobs, but kept my coffee job um, towards like a, a little bit before 2008. But 2008, we received a flyer for Seattle Coffee Fest. And me and my best friend Santiago, who was like the network guy at the time, we were, we were just like, you know, let's go. Let's, let's see what this is about. And so being there just completely blew my mind. This was this was the year that I first met you. Um, I took a latte art class. I still remember <laughs> the bank, like I still remember the room. And I remember shaking your hand at the corner at the end of the class. You're pouring lattes. It was horrible. But I was so <laughs> excited with this new thing that I had just learned. And you know, I I had this little booklet for to t- to take the test to get certified at the end of it. And I I realized how much of a geek I was because I sought those certifications. I went to I went on to like going to barista camp. Uh, the last camp polar shot in Santa Barbara was where I first got my level one cert- certification, and I just I knew that this was something that I was going to pursue. So just going back to two thousand and eight, Santi and I were just completely like, wow, specialty coffee. Had no idea that existed, and I think that then made me realize that I had found like my pot of gold, like this job that I've been doing for for eight years that I just loved the interactions and I couldn't give that up. I could actually make this my career because there's an, a whole industry behind it and so much to learn. So yeah, I think that, that that's what led me to pursue coffee and still like never ending pursuit to like just really like master my craft and now more than anything, my leadership style. Wow. Uh, so it, it's really awesome that you, uh, and I met in 2008 <laughs> in, in a latte art class. And, uh, yeah, I, what a cool uh, story to sort of find, not just a, um, something that makes you change your mind because oftentimes that happens when we discover something about coffee like maybe we hated it before and then all of a sudden we thought this is something i can love you already loved it you loved it for eight years and Mm -hmm. this was like another level of you know validation to say now you thought you loved it before you're going to love it even more now that you you've discovered this this other world and these uh, this community of people that can add to the you know experiences that you've had because you know places like Coffee Fest and going to SCA and things like that, all of the people you see have these backgrounds where they too had like an epiphany or a, or a milestone moment, uh, and so uh, no doubt this this kind of not only steeled your resolve but you know deepened your your commitment to it. Uh, it seems like you were already committed to it, but I mean. Tangibly speaking, like after leaving Coffee Fest um, with that kind of experience, what happened after that that really changed the way that you pursued coffee? Well, it's funny, as you were just saying all of that, I realized too, I may, I might be wrong, but I feel like that, the, that, that first, those first eight years, I don't even think I liked the taste of coffee. Ah. because the way that I was trained was push this button, leave this hopper. And I had like the clack, clack, clack grinder and I love them and mm-hmm. I miss them so much. But, you know, it was way back in those days when you were like, you, you were supposed to leave that grinder filled with ground espresso because that was the polite thing to do. We, pre- you know, just things didn't taste right. <laughs> and I had an Italian regular that told me, Hey, this is how I want you to pull my shop. Yeah. Fill up that porta filter hit the button for this many seconds and he'll tell me when to cut it, you know? And now I know that that's, ristretto. you know, like, I mean, we, we, we serve ristretto shots at, at Blue Bottle for our house espresso. So it just, there was something about putting it all together that I loved, but I don't like sweets. So I never drank any of the, the blended drinks we made or anything. It was just really about having an instinct about this might be good together when I made recommendations, but nothing really tasted good back then. 
Mm. So after 2008, now to answer your question, when we came back, like Santi and I realized that, you know, what we would like to have and what we realized was out there that we had no idea was that we could partner with a roaster that provided the training, the equipment, and all, just all of this back end support that we'd never had before. Um, behind just being, you know, so we used to serve Delano's, I remember back in the day, and I, I knew nobody then um, at Delano's. And as we started searching for that relationship and that coffee that we, we, we tried coffee from Zoka, which I realized is where Bronwyn was from. She was probably there around that time. We were just requesting samples from all roasters around the country, which is how I eventually met Blue Bottle. Um, but they weren't doing there, you know, they were very small at the time, didn't have any wholesale accounts. So we ended up actually landing with, with Barefoot. And it was the oh, time man. of Andy Newbaum and Tony Serrano, Iver, who now owns Chromatic, was on the production team, you know, and they were they were our first like relationships um, in, in, in the industry. And so we drove up to San Jose, got our first like legit training and oh, everything was just so exciting to me. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of how it um, ended up happening. We found Barefoot, wanted to have a relationship with them, got our um you know, train got more training outside of Coffee Fest initially and started just turning things. Around. Oh, I remember the sleepless nights we had. I had to program the new POS. We did a really radical thing, switching Cyber Java to Tiago. Overnight, we ripped everything out. All of the automatic brewers, we put a pour over in place. We got rid of the 20 ounce cup and we I did not sleep that night. We had to program everything. We changed the menu, did everything by hand, even the <laughs> wow. furniture to this place and launched the next day without training anyone. So definitely would never do that again, which is why <laughs> I had to stay that whole day because we had to teach everyone how to explain everything that we've changed. And man, oh man, we angered and lost a lot of customers, but we knew that that was the risk we were willing to take to gain the people that we knew that would hopefully see and respect um, the, the change and the, and the why behind the change that we did, you know? And, and I think at the time we were probably the only specialty coffee spot in that, in that Hollywood area. I think I can really confidently say that. Well, it's really interesting because, you know, it, you mentioned like you wouldn't do that today, but in the moment it was such a obvious choice for you. And there was so much momentum behind your decisions um, so you're just acting on that passion because it seems like you just didn't want to lose that momentum. And I guess, had you not done that, maybe were, were you afraid that you were, that might happen? You know, I don't know what we were thinking. I was, I was Santiago's right hand man. This was his grand plan. This is how we're going to do it. And I was just like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> right. Well, after that transition, uh, if, shortly thereafter, you did make the step to Blue Bottle. Um, mm -hmm. And at this point, after eight or so years in the industry, um, you've probably picked up on some, you know, leadership perspectives and skills that, you know, you have even today that maybe you learned back then, but I'm interested in, in learning how you discovered that you had a knack for not just the uh, working of the bar, but the teaching of it and the leadership that goes into that. So between 2008 and 2010, when I left LA and, and Tiago, you know, Santi had me be the, the cafe, the cafe manager. And he and I were like, yin and yang you know like we really complimented each other I was front of house he was back of house and did all of that back end stuff in the business but I felt really inequipped I felt inequipped to do this manager role I had no idea like I have a degree I mean my degree was in business management but this is like real life and then I'd never done this before and I felt like I was letting him down and that I was also letting myself down I just felt really lost and so my decision to like to jump over to Blue Bottle was me seeking potentially a more structured, a company that's been around and probably had structure into training a manager at the time. And funny enough, we had none of that yet. <laughs> um, when I joined Blue Bottle in 2010 as a barista, we were seven cafes big. 
you know, we had the Mint Plaza, we still had like the SF MoMA rooftop cafe. We, we were very small and still very mom and pop. And so gratefully, um, I was hired by Vanessa Mowell, who has been with the company. She's, you know, friends with James and Caitlin from school. And I just, to this day, feel very blessed that I kind of like grew up under her guidance and support because what I had come to love about working at Blue Bottle was the culture and, and, and the culture is still what keeps me there. The values, our style of leadership, everything that just resonates with me as a person. And this is why it's, I'm, I'm doing air quotes, easy for me to do my job is because my internal motivations and like my values guide me. And it was all just because of the, the, the foundation and the roots that Vanessa had planted with me. Mm-hmm. So as a barista there, you know, um, you know, and this was when like probably at, at the point that Blue Bottle had the intentions of growing. We had just opened, I think, the New York market around that time. So we were expanding. And so within my first year, so within the first six months, I had the opportunity to become the lead barista at the Ferry Building. And the Ferry Building was our heaviest volume cafe at the time. It was, we had two lines, line never ended. It was 30 minutes to get coffee. I didn't know who the hell we were. I didn't know much about Blue Bottle by then, you know, but internally, like, I just knew like, okay, I'm going to do my best to learn everything that I can and see, you know, like what doors open, open up for me. And the doors just open up very quickly because the opportunities were there. And I guess I was, I was showing up in that way, you know, like, um, so yeah, so then within the first six to eight months, I believe Lead Barista opened up for me and I did that role. And I always say that that role is my spirit animal. It still continues to be. Um, Cause I think that that's where like the whole like quality controlling, always tasting coffee, um, always sharing my knowledge, always like orchestrating bar flow. Like that's where that love is for me. And I always operate as that. Um, and then I think within the first year, Vanessa got promoted and she still maintained, remained my boss, but then I had the opportunity to actually manage our ferry building cafe. So tell me more about the uh, process of becoming a lead barista and taking on a, a next step in management and these opportunities that opened up to you. Um, you you had to, obviously, you said this is your uh, spirit animal, your sweet spot, um, in you appreciated the position of leadership, and I'm curious why. Uh, you mentioned the resonance of the values of of management and leadership that Blue Bottle had, and how that was something you uh, just loved, and it makes your job easy. How, how did that factor in, uh, and what made you say not just being a barista, but I need to be in a leadership position? I mean, and for most of us, right? Like, honestly, I think about Jiro Dreams of Sushi, like I would love to be a barista forever, right? But I think jumping into leadership is kind of makes that role more sustainable, I guess, in a way, right? Financially sustainable. Right. And and I don't shy away from responsibility. So um, I think it was just natural and, and, and everything like in my growth and the doors that opened up all felt good. Um, As a lead barista, I was in charge for like education. Um, Since there were only seven cafes and there's seven days in a week, each lead barista from each cafe spent one one day at Webster, which was our roastery, which is now closed, which was a very sad day for me. um, Mm. It was in November that we lost the building. Um, But just a lot of history there. I spent one day a week setting up the production cupping for the roasters like literally setting up all the cups, all of the grind samples, a whole table, maybe 20 plus samples every single time, sat in the room with people like Steve and Vic and just like all of the roasters, all of the production team that we've had. And, you know, that that helped me create a bond with the other side of coffee that I don't deal with in retail, um, took back that information. And it was just, um, I don't know, it was just like all very exciting to me. Mm-hmm. I don't think that my palate is my strongest suit, but I have tasted a lot of coffee and I can confidently call out things that I call out. But I've learned from people that I've met that like, yeah, it's it's not the end all be all of a coffee professional, you know, but I do have a lot to share with that when it comes to tasting coffee and comparing and understanding processing. So I shared all of that with the team. And every time there was a new coffee being rolled out, 
that was my responsibility. We had like one sheets, which was information about the coffee, making sure that the team tasted, that we dialed things in together, you know, and it's a lot more structured now when it comes to that. We have recipes that we follow to make things easier for the baristas. In the role, you know, you are providing a kind of a, a, that leadership that a crew of people needs to mm. be confident in representing the product to the customer and, and being satisfied as as baristas. And I, I've always maintained the importance of the manager role as probably the most important leadership role in a company, considering that you are working with them on a constant basis and um, you're present as an authority and you're using either your authority for their benefit or for your own benefit. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And so um, I want to dig into the values that you mentioned that you have around leadership and Blue Bottle's values. And if you could articulate those a little bit uh, more specifically, I mean, what are those values that you feel are integral to being a good leader and manager? When I first started, the company values were like just the three words. And I think that that's what we call them. And they've they've changed and evolved by now, but those three words still stuck with me. And it was deliciousness, hospitality, sustainability. Um, before Blue Bottle's growth also, like I knew that our culture was near and dear to all. We, we were so close. Everyone in the company was so close because we all knew each other. It was still small. We visited each other's cafes. And there was just that feeling of I found the right place for myself, the way that Vanessa managed me and showed me how to lead others. It was always coming from a place of support, right? If I understand my role as a barista, every decision, and this is still how I function, every decision that I make in the cafe or every new thing that we have to roll out, which is a lot lately as you know, as we've grown, <laughs> I'm always thinking about how is this going to affect my baristas? How can I train them to prepare them for this change how will it impact the team and the guests and i just try to like think about all of that um and make it make transitions and change as easy as possible it's like my same mentality behind i have such a specific bar flow it's one of the things that you know like i heavily talk about and train on because our cafe is really small but we're super busy so it's just constant coaching observation awareness that is always led by the want and the need to support because if I'm not on bar 40 hours a week doing what I love making connections with my guests now I get to do it through my team by just orchestrating that and giving them the tools sharing my values sharing my love as much as I can by just constantly being aware of where everyone's at um another thing so aside from like the initial values of deliciousness sustainability hospitality that always like were my north stars right so back then we didn't really have much of a training structure for management it was literally just management here's how i ordered this here's the ordering schedule these are the things that you have to do but everything else i had to fill in and give life and give color and figure out what was important to me and i i knew that as a barista and as somebody that worked shoulder to shoulder with my baristas, what we all thrived in was the volume and serving that many guests constantly, but enjoying and having like that much fun behind bar, nailing every single thing. Um, back in my days at the Ferry Building was also like at the peak of the Bay, Bay Area coffee community. And so me, along with a lot of my my team, we were we were always at these throwdowns. And we brought that like competitive culture back into the cafe. And like just the quality, like was just we became like so well known, you know, like in my time at the ferry building for like just amazing latte art, amazing coffee, amazing interactions with our guests. We knew everyone by name and by order by the time they made it to the POS from all the way at the end of the line, their drink and their order would be ready. And it was just like such a great time. And I think that those moments of what I know I enjoyed as a barista along with the team, those are still the things that continue to guide me because then that's always the, um, I guess the environment that I always want to create around myself. So you'll feel that in my cafe, but even when I'm doing it at Expo, I want the baristas to have fun. I want them to enjoy what they're doing and maybe like 
if this we, this long weekend of expo and working behind bar with me gave them that much joy that they then end up also pursuing a career in coffee. Those are the things that kind of like motivate me or propel me to keep doing things the way that I do. Um, and then lastly, just when going back to like leadership and the things that resonate really hard with me and in our leadership style at Blue Bottle, you know, so it was only since I think opening in LA that we actually had a rigid leadership training program. And it was because we realized in our growth that it wasn't just going to be about managers and managing cafes, that for, for Blue Bottle to successfully grow, we had to pour into our people. And so our titles, our titles had changed from coffee bar manager or whatever we chose to call ourselves to cafe leaders, because then a big part of our role became people leadership. And this was, this was again, a turning point for me now, like really geeking out hard on, on leadership stuff was there's again, just like with making coffee, there's a right way to do something and you'll see the immediate impact of that. And so the way that we're taught to lead or just, you know, like, yeah, just to lead is it's always team first, guest, and then business. That is like the order of how our job descriptions are laid out. Every decision that that's made is with putting, you know, is made with putting team first, guest, and business. And that just, again, like made a lot of sense to me. Um, so it's very easy for me to like just absorb all of the information that I'm I'm trained on, want to make things come to life because like I understood that there was value to what I was learning. And if I did this, if I pushed myself to lead in this way, like it would be to like the success and benefit of my team. And I think that that's ultimately what what has led to just the growth of our regular base at Abbott Kidney and why we're as the smallest cafe and we don't serve toast or anything like that. We're not, you know, we, we didn't have that structure when we opened Abbott Kinney, but Abbott Kinney is still one of like the busiest cafes in our, in our whole region. Your experience or the experience you give your team through your leadership and uh, how they then serve creates the experience that the customers have. And it, the, the trust that that kind of consistent business represents is validation to the kind of leadership that produces it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm curious about how in this evolution of sort of filling in, like adding life and color to the, um, the construct of what it looks like to be a manager to then having a little bit more of a rigid format, but still maintaining those values and you mentioned, you know, how you had to uh, fill in the blanks or, or add life and color to the structure of your role as a manager with, you know, certain values and ways of doing things. Like it's very much your fingerprint on that cafe. Um, and mm -hmm. today, I mean, how do you, how have you systematized that so that as, as you bring new people on and maintain the training of the people who have been on, you know, you have a predictable result? So our training program has evolved. And I think a lot of, from, from what I understand, a lot of other coffee companies have, um, have gotten rid of their training departments as well. And so we, we still have our lab at Las Feliz, but it is no longer being utilized in the way that it was. And um, so now we have a, an internal learning management, management system that we call the Bloom. So there's a structure. So I actually just had to do this. I worked 11 hours yesterday because I had to be on shift and map out the first month of training for somebody that's starting tomorrow. And so we, we have structure in that. And there's, you know, they're supposed to do what we call like modules. So they go through modules about uh, company background, company values, and then you get into like the hard skill stuff. Like this is how we do drip. So the first month of training is broken down into some modules that they have to sit down and like watch videos about. And I provide them a notebook and all of these things. Um, and then that is partnered with three hours of what we call um, in-cafe skill building. So each cafe team now has not just me, the cafe leader, I have an assistant cafe leader and two to three shift leads. We all comprise what kicks in as learning coaches. And so all of the training now happens in cafe and yeah, that can be really inconsistent. It could be inconsistent in how 
those new team members are scheduled because anyway, things can happen. But for me is again, like looking over the whole program outline, I believe in, in, in how it can work and taking on the responsibility of me making sure that I'm scheduling the way that I should, that this new hire is always partnered with a shift lead for like just maximum success and feedback and direction and coaching. So I, I try to stay really by the book when it comes to like the programmatic stuff. And now me giving things life is, and adding the color is again, like I think one of the things that I'm most proud of now is where I would have been, where I would have wanted to be the one always training because I know how I would teach. I know what I would say, but allowing my shift leads and the rest of like my like learning coach team in the cafe, giving them the opportunity to find their footing. And so me leading through them, observe, I'm always, I, I, that's, I think that that's my main thing is like, even though I delegate something out, I'm still watching over it, giving feedback, making sure that they're covering the bases that I would myself but giving somebody else the opportunity to step up in their leadership and find their own leadership style. So, so we, we have a formula for, for onboarding and I try to follow it as much as possible because there is success to it and, and breaking down. And then I incorporate a lot of like cafe specific things like bar flow. And I really try to be mindful about how to break that down because I played basketball in college. So I always like joke that it's like my triangle offense, um, <laughs> but it really is. It's the use of the space, right? Like I have a very small bar and we try to maximize our movements, try to maximize support. We're always like fine tuning this until people get it. And we, we reach the point where great. Every I've planted my seeds now, just like watering and let them grow. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one thing too, about giving something life is, Somewhere in our people leadership training, we learned feedback methodology, and that was also mind blowing to me. And that has that was another turning point I think in my career was understanding communication and effective communication in that. And all of these concepts, Bronwyn and I have actually been sharing at Access, or I I don't know if we've shared it at SAA before too, but this became like our like this became like my motivation again. I found something that's so fascinating to me. If you think about how you communicate something, you know, like the way that you package something determines really whether or not you came, you, you came across effectively or not, or if you just shut somebody down. And so feedback methodology was introduced maybe five years back. And I, again, wanted to make this thing a living, breathing thing. So in our cafe, every single day, I created what we call post-shift feedback. And so the team would then understand how to use feedback, practice the concepts that they've learned, and it helped build our relationships with each other. It helped leave stresses at the cafe or we work them out here. And so we do post shift feedback every day, midday, the morning crew before they leave. And since that was like the heaviest part of the service, we, after side work, sit down and talk about the shift. And it can be like a basic format of what did we do re really well together today? What were some opportunities? And also an opportunity to give each other like positive and constructive feedback. And this is also like now how everyone in the team is constantly growing every single day. We're constantly fine tuning. And so I know it probably sounds exhausting on my end, but but these these are the things that motivate me and give me life is being able to have input, being able to like, let them know that I am observing and I am present and I am here and committed to them growing. And, you know, like the whole team, we, we have a really great relationship with each other. And I think there's one of your questions, how do you know that it's successful? And that's one of the biggest things, um, like feedback my cafe will always receive, whether it's from higher up blue bottle, you know, when they come to visit or, or shared regulars is every time they come into the shop, the team is always so happy and there's a different energy and they feel it and everybody's focused on work. And that, that fills my heart. I feel like mm. when I hear that kind of stuff, I know that my work and all of the exhaustive coaching conversations, individual conversations have been, have not been for nothing because they've been felt. 
Wow. Happiness of employees as a metric for success. You can't <laughs> right? lose with that, totally right? Totally tangible. Yeah. Um, and you hit on something I think that's really important to dwell on a little bit, and that is the relationship that you have with your team and the success of the initiatives and uh, feedback is it, it's necessary for there to be trust and good relationship because as you were talking about having post shift feedback, I can just imagine there being, and there, there probably is a lot of people that say, well, we do something like that, but no one ever wants to share or it becomes pretty rote, you know, yeah. um, it's just mechanical. And then oftentimes people will be afraid to do it because what if the baristas share something with me that I can't do anything about? And then they get frustrated, which this happens where people get frustrated, baristas might, Mm -hmm. because, you know, I I told Selena about this thing that happened and nothing's happened about that in the last three weeks or so. I mean, how do you mitigate the risk? And I hate to even use the word risk because I think feedback's always great. But Mm -hmm. how do you manage saying no, yet still maintaining the uh, excitement and buy-in for uh, having an institution like post-shift feedback, whatever form it might take? You know, I can't think of an example where I've really had to say no about something, but I think what comes in, what comes to mind generally is just, again, one of the things that we learned as, you know, in our people leadership training, feedback methodology, and all of these things, you know, we had a lot of like Simon Sinek stuff that we were um, shared, you know, leading with the why. Yeah. And I think that that's always crucial. And that's something I literally was just talking about again yesterday, trying to coach one of my shift leads on how to give critical feedback to another barista that tends to be um, resistant to being given feedback. Mm -hmm. So I know it's daunting, but I think just having those tools, I think really helps me leverage how to have those difficult conversations myself, whether it's saying no to something or not, but also like I'm a problem solver. So I don't know that there's anything really lately that's come up, but I, you know, and I, and I know the cafe and I know the company, like the back of my hand. So any, I, I don't think I've ever felt the hesitance to have to say no to something without a good why behind it. And the conversation ended up fine, you know? So right. a lot of the things that happen in post is, or the things that I, I have to like that don't happen in the group is like, let's say shift the day before somebody didn't feel supported. This person wasn't chipping in. They were like, you know, we had a rush. They were just standing there. I didn't know how to share it. I really, I was really frustrated. I pick up, picked up on like most of the work. Right. And it, it was so emotionally charged or things that are emotionally charged. I, and again, I think this is like what I've, I love that I've learned through my people leadership training is where usually I would just step in or I, I, I can see where most managers would just step in and either like take one person's side over the other. Understanding feedback and understanding communication, you know, it's in those moments, just like letting those baristas vent and remove some of that frustration by maybe sharing some perspective. And, but then also giving, the, giving it back to them. And did you share that feedback? Did you want me to partner you with a shift lead to help you share that feedback. And so for them to ultimately understand that they have power, they have mm-hmm. power in like squashing this, that's probably very squashable, but just giving yourself the time and like the tools. And so it's a lot of that whenever I receive like all of all of these situations happening in the cafe, which is has been happening a lot. And since the pandemic, especially at the beginning of the year has been really stressful, but you know, I receive all this information. I think the best way you know, like I think as much as I can about what the best, what I should be communicating. How do I calm them down? How do I maintain like the peace, but give them the tools to address it themselves before I step in? And then, you know, so basically I talk to both parties individually, let them know the situation, but let them know that I expect them to be able to give each other the feedback and I could be there with you. Here's what I would say, or, you know, I would give them the tools. I'll offer to be there with you for that conversation if you need it? Do you want me to have a shift lead there or do you think you can handle it? And I think that's helped with just maturity 
also, mm-hmm. and just like understanding how to communicate and also letting them fail. Like if they say it the wrong way and they made the situation worse, well, I guess we learned from that, but here's how to fix it, <laughs> you know? And it's just, and it, it, and it's just constant, you know? And I think one thing that I, I, I will add that some people might find funny, but I do say this a lot. I think a lot of my motivations behind like the things that I do and the, the things that I care about is I'm a Libra and I really care about harmony and mm-hmm. I really hate conflict. And so just everything, whether it's getting along on bar and working well together, it's all part of me wanting to create harmony within the team, along with a sense of like just accomplishment and pride in our work and making this an experience for our guests and for our team. Like I just, there's always so many things going on in the back of my head that basically like motivate like why and how I orchestrate things in the cafe the way that I do, or no, no matter what coffee bar I'm at, you know, mm-hmm. even at Expo. Well, well, that's a good point because in the moment there is, uh, in the mind of maybe one giving a very specific kind of feedback, there's one issue on the table, mm-hmm. only one. But in your, from your perspective, as someone who's in leadership, you have to not only manage this particular situation, but in context of the entire thing. And it's back to the idea of team first. So yeah. in that moment, you're kind of kind of saying, like, how can we make this a team resolution uh, and not just a, you know, singular kind of myopic focus on this one particular issue, which I think is really smart. And also, I, I think balancing to a situation where you're working in a, like Blue Bottle is a big company now, of course, and Mm -hmm. there's these modules, there are prescribed solutions in terms of standards and things like that. And for the most part, I think it's easy to sort of default to what the standard manual answer is for things and sort of outsource that decision-making skill to somebody else. So mm-hmm. you know, like asking you to make it all better instead of having them do it, you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. Seems like the natural bent, especially when there's a lot of systems in place, um, but balancing it by saying you can make that decision or you have to exercise that muscle in order to thrive in this environment. It's not just, um, I hate to use the word spoon fed, but like this is about autonomy. And, you know, I think you have pride in your work, especially when you take some ownership over it. And uh, that's what that kind of uh, example you just shared kind of brings up for me. Yeah. And and I think too, you know, again, like, I don't know if it's like a pandemic thing or you don't just, it's, it's been a while since I've had anyone apply that has had previous coffee experience. Um, But we're, I think where I find myself now, and I know a lot of my my peers outside of Blue Bottle too, is the the workforce that's out there right now is a very young, very fresh, very new to not just coffee, but to just working, you know, and Mm -hmm. because my standard, like I have really high standards because I have really high standards for myself as a barista. And I'm just constantly trying to figure out ways how to, I don't know, how to share those values because I feel like it's easier to come from a place of, I don't know, like my heart's in this, like let's say quality, right? Somebody can just like stand at, stand at the steam wand, pump out milk, 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 and not care about the texture or the temperature and just think they're doing their job, right? But for me to say like, hey, I need you to focus look at this, you should be able to gauge for yourself what is good milk before you hand it off and potentially have a guest, you know, who stood in line or waited however long and paid for this, for them to receive something that's just not up to standard. So I'm always like looking out for those situations, whether it's like related to a hard skill or moments where I've had my experience teaching for SEA or being at barista camp, I have a lot of knowledge to share. And it, especially like when I grew up in coffee, it was like very sensory. It was all about tiger striping back in the day. Oh man! Now it's about like, right now it's ratios and scales and automatic machines, but I fight, I fight for them to, to see and feel the things that I 
enjoyed in when I first learned coffee. So like, I think I try as much as I can with each individual barista to find their why, like what keeps you here, what brought you here and how can I like help you use that like intrinsic motivator to do your best work while we're here together, right? Whether or not you are here to have a career in coffee or whether this is just like a gig while you're in school, you chose to be here for a reason. This is something I personally care about so much because this is my life. And I try to like figure out it as har- harmoniously as possible, how to like bridge that gap and make, make this work out for both of us. What do you do with the tension in those moments where if you have to, you know, talk to somebody about their milk steaming, uh, but at the same time you want harmony. So a lot of people take that disposition of wanting harmony and they just avoid the conversation. So this is exactly why I do post shift because feedback is hard and feedback and communication isn't natural. There's a right way to do it. And also on the receiving end of things, right? Like you also have those guidelines, like don't take things personally and all of these things. So this is why I created push of feedback to normalize the process of Mm. giving and receiving feedback. So it's expected. These little things when it comes to hard skills, they are like the least of my worries because I know that my baristas know how to give that feedback. And I can say like, hey, I observed on bar, like there were a couple of times where your milk looked a little like this either like pay attention to that or like, how can I help you make that better? Hey, let me partner you with Gus, my shift lead who loves teaching latte art and milk, right? And so because I've created this environment in the cafe around giving feedback, that small stuff, we don't sweat those things. We we talk about those very healthily, like in, in the shift. I love it. So embracing those is just a part of the culture. It's a part of the life there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really smart. And I, and I introduce like new hires into post shift right off the bat because I set it up as an expectation, but I make it very easy for them. The format for them is like, you know, like, I don't expect that you were able to observe the shift on your first shift ever. So like, tell me three things that you felt you did really well today and three things that you want us to support you on tomorrow. You know, I just, I, I try to like mindfully get them used to the process of sharing at least what their own experience is until they get to the point where they're able to like have more cafe awareness to be able to share feedback about others. That's great. Uh, You know, speaking of feedback, I'm, I'm really curious. Um, You know, I've had a lot of bad moments as a manager. I've done things that have not been great (laughs) and Mm -hmm. things that have been great. Um, Have you ever received feedback that's been challenging to you as a manager that has actually made you shift the way that you manage? You know, I, as somebody that really tries their, this is, this is now shifting from things that I say about me being a Libra to me, be me being an eldest child. Um, I'm, I kind of have a perfectionist side of me. I hate being told that I did something wrong. And I, when I say hate, it's like, not that I shy away from it. Of course it happens, but I was the, I was the kid that if I got reprimanded for something, I never do it again. And I always try to like do things right. And I think that that comes a lot like in like through in my leadership style. But I will say that I will never think of myself as as perfect. I will always, always see myself as someone that has things to learn, things to perfect. Perfection may or may not ever be, you know, achieved. But um, when I, I thought about this, like I would say it would be difficult conversations. And I, and I had to have one recently with one of my baristas, and it was because of past learning. Um, hard conversation, like I've cried the two times that I've had to let people go. Um, and just learning too that maybe those conversations should have happened sooner. So to answer your question, uh, the biggest opportunity that, that I've had as a leader, believe it or not, is courage. And I And I accepted when I got that feedback because I let myself, I lead, I lead very heavily with empathy and I will always embrace that. And whenever I have like maybe people that aren't quite working out, um, I have been blinded to their impact to the rest of the team, thinking that I can change them. If I pour more into them, they will do better. And so a lot of those difficult conversations, like I shied away from, but now because of receiving that feedback, I 
I mean, they're always hard when they come up and I, and I lose sleep over them, over preparing. I'm like, you know, I write down notes. How am I going to say this the best way? But once I have them, and I think I have been having more of those difficult conversations lately that have made me feel stronger, like even more as a leader. And not that, um, not that my baristas don't look at me with respect, but I think for myself, I have more respect for myself, being able to put my foot down more and call a spade a spade or, or whatever you call it. But that's what I thought of when I, when I saw that question. I think having courage, especially when it comes to like having difficult conversations um, has kind of like big, been my biggest challenge, but it's something that I'm continuing to push myself on. As you talk about that, I, I, I am really just thinking about how many people have kind of shared similar stories about, you know, why are, why is my staff all of a sudden, they, they, they experience a lot of dissent in the ranks, you know, there's, there's an uprising and there's a lot of dis, discontent. And mm-hmm. um, it, what, what comes out is that there is this natural tendency, maybe for people getting into coffee uh, in general, maybe there's a lot of empathy that we have in common. And there's an avoidance of those difficult conversations. I mean, there's plenty of books out there <laughs> on yeah. having, you know, conflict conversations, et cetera. So, um, but I wonder, you know, in the process of um, addressing that, you you mentioned like you're you're more confident in yourself. Is it trusting that you're making the right decision or that you're not betraying your values that's giving you more confidence as you work on that? I think what's giving me more confidence is again, like learning from past mistakes um, and not wanting the, like wanting to show, I, I think what it is is me wanting to show up for my team and like removing my hyper focus on one person and realizing like, the rest of the team suffers if I don't make a decision faster or have a conversation sooner. And I I actually recently, before going on PTO last week, had to sit down with somebody and have a hard conversation. And he even acknowledged to me, is like, I know this conversation wasn't easy for you to have. And I appreciate you giving me this feedback and I can step up and do better. Because nice. basically I told him, I told him, I, I'm very also like, I think my communication style is also very transparent. And I told him, I do not want to make the same mistake I did in the past where I let somebody stay for too long and the rest of the team suffered. Wow. And yeah. I know that you want to be here. I want you to be here, but something has to change because you're not showing up the way we need you to. And we've given you everything we've got. And I, I even told him, like, if you still need support on Barflow or how to support your team, I'm I'm willing to have continue to have those conversations with you. But when it comes to like you not being present or focused, like that just needs to change because everyone's noticing and everyone's suffering for it. And he took it really, it ended up being like a really great conversation that I was so nervous leading up to that point. But I just like, it, it was just one of those things like, no, this is my job. This is my role. And I have to do this. Where before I would have thought about like the person and like, no, I can change him. I can pour and or I, I need him on shift because he works five shifts and I don't have any all of those other things. I had all of these excuses for not sitting down and having a hard conversation with someone. And the rest of the team suffered because this was somebody with a bad personality or never supported or was rude. And I, I just don't want that to happen. And, and again, like it comes from me wanting to have harmony, maintaining the peace, doing good work together. And if something's impacting that or isn't the way of achieving those goals, then it's on me to address it and fix it and provide the tools. Well said. Yeah, that I, I'm, I'm really impressed at, at the candor of, of that uh, conversation. And so many times, if, if uh, I'm having a conversation with somebody and they say, well, here's how I feel about this situation, and they elaborate in detail. And I'm like, well, it sounds like you should just say those exact words um, to that person you know, Mm -hmm. uh, but we want to like word craft it in, in like, you know, a lot of flowery talk and just kind of hem and haw and being, uh, not that there's only one way to communicate, but often Mm -hmm. we just don't trust our gut, um, when it comes to these things. So that's a really good example. To that point, like I see what you're saying in that, and that's something I'm very careful of because for example, 
with feedback me methodology, there's like one concept that we're, we're taught, right? I don't know if you've heard about the feedback ratio, six, six positive to one constructive. Mm, no, I hadn't heard about so, that. Yeah. And so some people might hyper like fixate on like that number and ratio like, oh, let me tell you six things you did well today <laughs> just so that I can show you one. But I'm like, but that's not the point, right? The whole point is you don't just blurt out something, something somebody did wrong, but you have to take a step back and think about it. And some, you know, I, I've heard opinions like, oh, well, that seems very packaged or sugarcoated. But I'm like, this is me understanding something that I'm reading in a book or whatever in a training and me bringing it to life and making it my own. It's not about literally having six positive feedback to one constructive. It's about make sure that you're packaging, make sure that you also have something good to say before you give constructive or that you have something good to say at all. And if you don't, maybe wait for another time to share this constructive feedback or the whole feedback approach, which is, hey, do you, can, do you mind if I give you some feedback? That simple question is so hard to blurt out because then like once you say it, like you have to say what's on your mind. And that's something that I always coach people on is like, just figure that part out. How do you wanna like approach the fact that you have feedback to share? But yeah, like for me, it's about understanding the why behind all of these concepts and making it my own so then we can have real talk, but in a really healthy way. I mean, this is so true for every aspect of bar work, whether it's related to customer service and hospitality or just the way that the coffee is made. Um, being able to curate that experience for your staff and customers means that you're you're present and you're active and you're, you're hands-on in the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and so you're cultivating something that can lead to that metric of happiness we talked about earlier where people come in and they say, the staff are happy, it's a busy store, and this didn't just happen <laughs> by accident, obviously. No, and, and honestly, like right now, like half of my team is, so like one, one thing that I was also proud of is I've had really seasoned tenured baristas. I've had baristas that have been with, with me for the past maybe average five years. And, you know, with the pandemic and the stresses and, you know, that dynamic has changed. And now I'm dealing with a, a, a team that's predominantly like less than a year in. And so on the one hand, I'm very proud that that's still the feedback received, even just recently um, while I was on PTO, you know, my area leader had stepped in and just gave me the compliment of like, you want, you know, he told me I, I run a well-oiled ship. You could feel the passion and dedication from all of your team. And for me in the back end, I'm always hard on myself. I was like, I'm still working on that too, but I'm glad that that's what you, you know, were able to like at least experience in your short time there. Because there, there's so much work that goes into it. And it's because like, I, I, I have to be relentless. And I, you know, I have a relationship, with, a, a relationship with James Freeman, who I spent my PTO with last week at his ranch in Ojai. And I think that that's also a big fuel behind why I work the way that I work is, I feel a sense of responsibility to protect and maintain the culture that he created that paved the way for me having such a fulfilling career at Blue Bottle, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I fight for that. How, however, I have to create that shared language, just drilling in the culture. This is not how we speak to each other. Hey, this is how we do things. Your latte art should look like this. Your milk should look like that. Your espresso should taste like this. I'm just like <laughs> constantly on it. But it doesn't sound so complicated in the day. I, I promise you, my days do not feel complicated, but there's just always that constantly around me. Well, there's definitely momentum that builds over time as you do it, you know, and you also have the benefit of this atmosphere and this environment that and I bet a new barista, when they enter it, also feels that, yeah, that culture. And I would imagine mm -hmm. feels a sense of responsibility to not screw that up, you know, to, to add to it, to, to be a yeah. part of that. And that's an attractive, uh, at, you know, part of, uh, the business of being a barista is what, you know, got you into coffee in the internet cafe is the, it wasn't the coffee necessarily. It was, it was the culture and it was just like the work and the people and connecting. Um, and, and here you are 22 years later, basically, uh, doing that at such an elevated, uh, place, but with similar values. And, you know, like, I, I understand that it's not always going to be like baristas um, that 
necessarily are seeking that out. But again, for me, it's just like, well, you came here for a reason. This is what we do here. And whether or not you care about coffee, like this is what we do here and how, and we have the tools to make that. But also, why not work like that, right? Mm -hmm. Why not, even if you're only here for six months, work in a way that you're proud of what you do. You care about your team. We have a great relationship with each other. Our guests love us. Like, why would you want to just like sit there and push buttons and not interact anyway and you know with anyone around you versus you do all of these things and you have so much pride in your work and work doesn't feel like work and at the end of you know what I mean like mm -hmm. why would you want to work any other way instead of like having pride for what you do having a craft that you can constantly get better at um, having the support of your team being in an environment where there's like just so much like buzz and excitement and 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 love you know and I don't know. It's important to me, so I kind of force that up, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, that's I, I have my ways, but I'm, I'm good with people. So I don't think they realize that that's my MO, but it just happens. Love it. Love it. I so, will mold you. <laughs> you are doing such a fantastic job, obviously. <laughs> um, and so I guess the last question I have for you is for people in the uh, listening audience here, that are really interested in leveling up their management. I wonder if you would kind of speak to them what advice you might have for them uh, to really grow as leaders in their cafes and serve well, serve serve their staff well, serve their customers well. What would your advice be to them? You know, I was lucky to find like a company that, you know, like just shared my own values as a personal barista or, you know, as a professional barista. I'm, I'm trying to think of, of other managers or aspiring managers out there that might not have the environment that I have or the culture that I have. But so to kind of like level out that aspect of it, I think the answer is in the question, right? Like if you want to grow and you want to serve well, I think that should always be like the main why behind what you do and, and how you grow. Because before we had all of this structure into like how to lead our teams better, that was what motivated me in my early days at the ferry building, right? I knew my job as a barista. I knew what it took to for, for this bar to work really well and keep up with the volume that we had. But behind all of that and understand the inner, understanding the inner workings of that, every decision that I made, whether it was ordering, right? Like the management part of stuff, always like scheduling. It, it was always with the intention of supporting and doing a good job to make sure that the baristas continu can continue to do their job at the standards that we had it, you know? And so everything that I do is with that intention of serving, continuing to serve, giving my baristas to continue to serve well. And in my growth, it's just, it's always about people, learning communication. There's like so much material out there. Like a lot of our training were from like LinkedIn, LinkedIn learning. There's like such great information out there. It's hard to pinpoint like what were the big bullet points in my leadership style, or I guess I did pinpoint those, but focus on your people, right? Check in, make sure you develop relationships with your team and understand what they need. Be open to receiving feedback and ideas about how the cafe could be running well or what the cafe needs, you know, for the business to continue to grow and like what individuals need. I think what's What's given me a lot of um, motivation behind my role is, again, my role is people focused because in our growth, I am responsible for potentially raising the next leaders into like new cafes. And so that gives me a lot of like purpose be behind how I manage. But if I were to remove all of that and just think about how I run the cafe, I order, I schedule and I do everything with my baristas in mind. How will my, my decisions impact the harmony and the balance and how does my decisions support my team continuing to be able to face forward to the guests and continue to do good work it's it's just focusing on on my people and how am i providing for them to do a better job yeah with that north star there i think you're mm -hmm. absolutely on the path to learn a lot of great lessons and um just make good decisions uh, you know it, there's going to be uh, opportunities for growth and mistakes along the way. But as you've illustrated here, you've got a common goal 
all throughout your career and it served you well. It's allowed you to change in ways that are helpful to the team and to yourself. And Mm -hmm. it certainly uh, is a great example for for us to follow. And, uh, you know, honestly, if, you know, we get more people like you out there um, making the next generation of cafe leaders, you know, considerate of each other and uh, focusing on how they can make uh, a harmonious and happy workplace. It's it's a bright future for coffee. Um, so it, this has been really fun to talk uh, about management <laughs> and leadership. Selena, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you for all of this. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about something clearly I care about a lot, but I know I tend to talk really fast and ramble as I was like, oh, I'm so excited to talk about this. So, but just thank you for like, giving me the opportunity to get some nuggets out there because like, yeah, at the end of the day, like I love working in coffee and I just like want more people to like find the same values that I've had in my 22 years, you know? So where can we uh, stay in touch with you and, uh, you know, follow you on the socials and all that fun stuff? Sure. So the, the main social (laughs) that I use is Instagram. I feel like I, I keep in touch there with more people than not. And uh, so my my Instagram handle is at cellybean underscore 13. And cellybean is spelled like jelly bean, but with an S. Uh, well, thank you again, Selena. It's been wonderful to talk with you. And uh, we'll be seeing you around the industry. Thank you. Thank you. See you in Boston. Well, all I can say here is that I hope this episode has spoken to you and that you are inspired by Selena's example. So many things to take away from this, normalizing a culture of feedback in the cafe, having a transparent dedication to the well-being, success, and happiness of your staff, building that trust with them, and simply, you know, as a leader and, and a manager, being open to feedback to change yourself, even if it's difficult. You should probably listen to this conversation twice, to be honest. But I'm so thankful for professionals like Selena, and especially because we got a chance to talk to her here at Keys to the Shop. So a huge thank you to Selena for being our guest today. And if you want to follow her on Instagram, her handle there is at sellybean underscore 13. That's S-E-L-L-Y. And you can also reach out to her via email, and that address is selena.vigera at gmail.com. You can find all that in the show notes as well. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback from me about this episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, feel free to email me, chris at keys to the shop.com. You could also use that email to reach out about Keys to the Shop Consulting if you need some help in any aspect of your business to help you level up or start off on the right foot chris at keys to the shop.com and now speaking of coffee fest just like selena took this latte art class and she had this epiphany uh a moment of of what is possible in coffee by visiting coffee fest seattle in in 2008 that moment is available to you multiple times a year at coffee fest trade shows Uh, across the country. Coffee Fest this year is celebrating its 30th anniversary. So 30 years of running the Coffee Fest event, which I think is the best event to go to if you really want to equip your staff and yourself with the tools you need to succeed in specialty coffee retail, free and accessibly priced lectures, workshops, trainings, classes. There's the trade show floor, of course, competitions and the community of like-minded professionals The excitement and the culture is just palpable. And just like Selena experienced back in 2008, um, you leave a different person. So if you're interested in going to one of the remaining shows this year, it is happening in Chicago, Los Angeles, and then in Seattle. You can go to coffeefest.com to learn more information. And when you register, use the code KEYS to get 50% off your registration fee uh, at any of the 2022 shows. So again, coffeefest.com, use the code keys to uh, just get 50% off and uh, look at what's coming up in Chicago, Los Angeles, and Seattle. And I will see you at those shows, every one of them. So be sure to say hi when you do. So that is it for today, everybody. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. I hope that our conversation with Selena really impacted you in a positive way. Don't forget to subscribe to Keys to the Shop and share these episodes with a friend. Thank you so much. And as always, I hope that this episode 
has truly given you keys to the shop.